everyone, I'm Rebecca McLaughlin Eastham, and this week we're coming to you from the seventh annual edition of the World Government Summit in Dubai. This year, heads of state and international delegates have been discussing globalization and lending his name to the climate change cause with actor Harrison Ford. Let's get this thing done. A little later on, we'll discover how it could soon be much easier for non-Arabic speakers to learn the language. But first, discussing what will influence future generations of government around the world at WGS, including technology, with some 4,000 delegates from 140 countries. Opening WGS with a discussion about globalization and how governments can design the future of humanity, Mohammed Al Gagawi, the UAE's Minister of Cabinet Affairs in the Future, said that the value of the creative jobs industry is around $2.5 trillion, but by 2030, there will be a shortage of 85 million jobs within the sector. To fill the gap, he said the government was committed to teaching creativity and imagination to the UAE's youth. In other sessions, Lebanon's Prime Minister Saad Hariri spoke of wanting to make his country more like Dubai, underscoring anti-corruption reforms to overcome Lebanon's economic crisis and attract foreign investment. And the managing director of the IMF, Christine Lagarde, called her meeting with Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan about economic reforms constructive, reiterating that the IMF stood ready to support. In the AI sphere, musician Will I Am launched his voice-assisted technology platform Omega in partnership with UAE shopping mall operator Majd Al Fatain. The service, which the Grammy winner assures doesn't access user data like Siri or Alexa, is also being developed to understand multiple dialects in Arabic to enhance people's retail, entertainment, and overall living experience. If you had an assistant, the same way you would talk to your assistant, uh, the same way you talk to ours. Uh, the difference is. You won't have, you know, attitude or, or emotional flares. I'll give you a simple uh, example. I would say, play Drake. It plays Drake's and all the other songs that uh, the music industry has, 50 million songs plus. I could follow up the question by saying, you know, what's going on with him? Our system knows that him is Drake from the first command. For the third time, climate change was high on the WGS agenda. This year, focusing on its impact on the health of populations. According to the Center of Research on the Epidemiology of Disasters, last year at least 5,000 people died with almost 30 million needing emergency aid due to extreme weather. Whenever there is a severe event uh, comes from climate change, uh, the impact on the children, especially on their uh, nutrition and the way that they're, they're getting food is going to be disturbed. So that's going to be affecting their growth and their uh, life uh, developments. In this region, we're uh, heavily affected by the dust storms and the, 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 those, those uh, pollution movements from one continent to the other, which cause the, so many patients go to the hospital uh, as an impact of such, uh, such cyclones. More than 33% of the Arabian Gulf's marine species could be lost by 2090, so said scientists attending the WGS Climate Change Forum. It's a prospect that's jolted the UAE government into action. One of the biggest names at the annual event was actor and long-term environmentalist Harrison Ford. If nature isn't kept healthy, humans won't survive. Simple as that. The vice chair of the Conservation International Charity spoke about marine conservation, calling climate change the greatest moral challenge of our time. Meanwhile, former French President Laurent Fabius, who is now president of the French Constitutional Council, said that governments shouldn't be selfish and put their own interests ahead of protecting the planet. Having been central to the development of the Paris Agreement, the world's first climate change accord struck in 2015, Fabius added that the U.S. withdrawal from the deal was, quote, dangerous and sent the wrong message to the international community. On the sidelines of the summit, he spoke to Inspire. Laurent Fabius, thank you so much for speaking to Inspire Middle East. My pleasure. Let me ask you, is the world winning or losing the battle for climate change? It's 50-50. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, we had a great victory in the Paris uh, Agreement, and I was honored to chair it. And there have been a lot of reports since that moment showing that it's urgent and important. That's the positive side. But the negative side is that the figures are awfully bad, and that we have 
to be uh, urgently uh, more active if we want to save uh, humanity. Well, what is important, therefore, to say to President Trump regarding his withdrawal from the Paris Agreement? Well, I used to be very modest. I, I don't think that what I could say uh, would be very efficient. But, um, you know, there is Mr. Trump, and obviously his decisions are unfortunately very important. But three quarters of the American population think that climate change does exist, that it has a human uh, origin, and that there is a necessity for action. And that's important too. The Paris Agreement is somewhat ambiguous when it comes to carbon neutrality. When will we have a, a clearly defined net zero explanation? Uh, for uh, carbon neutrality, uh, we have to be more ambiguous. Why? Uh, many people, and I'm one of them, uh, consider that uh, carbon neutrality means that uh, the, the, the majority and of uh, the fossil fuels uh, have to be uh, to remain in the soil. Some other people say, okay, there can be the use of fossil fuel, uh, provided that uh, there is the equivalent number of sinks. And uh, we couldn't uh, have a more uh, precise definition because there was not an agreement. Imagine that, for instance, uh, Saudi Arabia is not very happy if you say that uh, in 2050 uh, they have to uh, leave uh, their oil in, in, in the soil. Therefore, it was a sort of ambiguity. How can multilateral action on climate change really be guaranteed in what could be called a very sceptical world? Yes, you're right. The, the, the world, at, at least at the government level, it's more and more sceptical. If you have to tackle these environment problems, it has to be multilateral. At the same time, uh, we have to uh, use the non-state actors and the ordinary people. Uh, because uh, did you see the number of young people uh, that are demonstrating in Europe today and more and more people are aware of that. If, if there is a climate warming, biodiversity is suffering. And if biodiversity is declining, it has an influence on uh, climate change. And all that has to do with peace and war. You mentioned the protests that are taking place in Europe. Can I ask you, if you were still Prime Minister of France, what would you do right now? I am not. <laughs> <laughs> no, now I'm chairing uh, the, our Supreme Court, our continuing court, and uh, there are uh, political authority who are in charge. Well, let me ask you this then. If a referendum takes place in May, do you think this will be sufficient to solve the crisis? Well, anyway, it, it will not be about climate, uh, and therefore I, I want to stick about legal affairs, and especially for you, climate. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. For language enthusiasts who want to wrap their head around spoken Arabic, academics in Abu Dhabi are looking to make the process a little easier. Salim Saeed investigates how a new technology has the potential to revolutionize the way in which we learn languages. How do our brains work? And how do our brains switch between speaking different languages? These are questions researchers at New York University Abu Dhabi are trying to figure out. How? By using multi-million dollar devices. The research uses data collected from advanced technology like this, a neuroimaging technique called magnetoencephalography, or MEG, which can read and record magnetic fields emitted from our brains. The equipment, which contains more than 200 sensors, is used by linguistic department academics to measure how much brain power people exert when changing languages. The areas of the brain predominantly used in language expression are the prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate cortex. Esti Blanco Eloreta is a fourth-year student who, in a two-year study, testing about 20 native bilingual speakers, discovered that when the group naturally alternated between Arabic and English without being requested to, both brain areas showed almost no activity. But if they were told to translate from one language to the other, both cortexes became highly engaged which means that the brain is using more resources or is using more of its activity in order to be able to perform this task. Other language-related research taking place in the capital is being conducted by researcher Dr. Samantha Ray, who I met with to understand how Arabic speakers produce sounds from their throats. Middle East and North African languages have around 29 pronounced sounds, compared to English with more than 40. 
and unlike many languages, Arabic is spoken by using the very back of the throat and the very front of the mouth, the entire vocal tract. To best explain things, Dr. Ray placed me inside an MRI machine and asked me to say the letters in Arabic that are uncommon to other languages. The images captured showed the range of muscles moving inside my windpipe. It's a new approach to learning that has produced some interesting results. For example, sounds such as a heavy K or Q, where the tongue pushes the uvula back instead of up, as in the case of the regular K common in English language. K. Q. We're, we're pushing the frontiers of how to do this research, of how to um, image parts of the throat that are utilized in these sounds of Arabic that are cross-linguistically quite rare. And along with her MRI research, she's hopeful that in the future, her findings may help students learning Arabic to visualize the way their bodies and brains are learning a foreign language in tandem. Well, that is a wrap of our show. We hope you enjoyed it. And don't forget, you can catch all of our programs online at urinews.com. Before I say goodbye, here are some social media posts that caught the attention of the team this week. South African Jack shared his Arabic language test result with friends, saying picking up new sounds was the most challenging part. UAE-based Shiva posted this shot of her at WGS, mentioning that she learned a lot from speaker Tony Robbins. And American AI fan Milena posted this video from the summit's Museum of the Future exhibit, highlighting ethical AI.